Testing. One, two, three. Testing. Testing. One, two, three. That's okay, isn't it? Testing. One, two, one, two. Testing. Yay! <laughs> testing, one, two, three, testing. Testing, that one's working. How's that sound? Can you hear it? Hello? No. Yeah? Yeah, no, that is coming out.
testing, testing, testing. I can hear it coming through the speakers. It's just not very loud. Where is the speaker? Yeah, OK. Yeah, I can definitely hear it coming through the speaker. <laughs> testing, welcome to the DPC briefing day on web and social media archiving.
Testing, one, two, three, testing.
up in there. Oh. for community and individual archives, um, a DPC briefing event, the last one for this calendar year. Uh, so as you can see from the title, um, it was a bit of a challenge to communicate to people what it is that we are looking at today and what we're focusing on. Uh, so I hope um, in this introduction and as the speakers um, that we have on the program today discuss their experiences uh, it will become more <laughs> clear or evolve that this is not a day looking at big data. This is not a day for doing big quantitative analysis. Uh, today is about looking at the individual people and the smaller communities who are very active and have very rich uh, sort of histories and memories that are being documented online who are worth capturing um, and what the methods and approaches we can use both as archivists and information professionals to ensure that we're capturing um, those interactions online, as well as how we can empower people um, to do that for themselves and to understand the value of the content that they're creating. Uh, so welcome again. If you are a Twitterer, um, we do have a hashtag for the day, um, which you can just see on this first slide. It's also on the bottom of your program. So do feel free. It is a social media and web event. Uh, so we are happy for you um, to share that with the wider world. So on the program today, um, after I stop speaking, you'll hear uh, from a number of different people who are working both with community and individual archives in other digital formats to give a bit of a background about um, how digital um, assets, digital personal collections have already begun to appear in archives and what those challenges are um, as opposed to big institutional archives or, or big data. Um, and then we'll hear about some case studies specifically about social media and how social media is being integrated uh, into wider web collections to represent different groups or different events um, or different places or people. Uh, and then after the lunch break, we have a little bit more of a practical session. So it is a workshop, so I do hope you will um, engage with the different tools and approaches that we'll discuss. Um, but just to say, we've chosen specific tools and methods, um, some of which are very quick and dirty. You can do it sitting right here at this table, download it and go. Uh, and then a couple of slightly more complex tools that might take you more like an afternoon to sit down uh, and get your head around. Uh, but the aim is to share methods that are easy to approach, whether you have a technical background or not, that are easy to teach others, to teach creators, um, people who might be depositing content in your archive or, or groups that you want to be able to empower to archive themselves. Um, and at the end of the day, for our next technical trick, um, we are going to have um, two of the creators of Social Feed Manager beamed in uh, all the way from Washington, D.C. to talk about um, how they have developed Social Feed Manager to collect social media as part of archive and library collections and to support researchers. 
So basically today is about learning how and why you would go about collecting the individual uh, web and social media creations of different individuals, different communities, so that we have these representative voices in the archives um, that are recorded to help give a richer, fuller picture of who is actually participating um, sort of in our, in our social lives. So with that, I hand you over to Sharon Webb. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is really weird. <laughs> I can hear myself. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that's better. Um, okay. Good morning. Um, I'm Sharon Webb. I'm a lecturer in um, the University of Sussex. I'm also a member of the Sussex Humanities Lab and I lecture in Digital Humanities. Um, I do traditional history as well. I do British and Irish history. Um, I do associational culture and social networks. I also do a lot of work around digital archiving, digital preservation, and um, looking at the use of technology for historical inquiry. Um, so for example, how we might use computational methods um, for historical sources. Um, I suppose my background is history and computer science. Um, and before I moved to the University um, of Sussex, I worked for the Digital Repository of Ireland. I was the requirements manager there, um, so worked closely with the software development team to develop the specifications for the Trusted Digital Repository. Um, worked with the policy manager as well for various policy developments for the Trusted Digital Repository um, and was on various task force included copyright and uh, metadata. Um, but today, I suppose I'm here to talk to you about a, a British Academy uh, project that I'm running. Um, it's called Identity, Representation and Preservation in Community Digital Archives and Collections. Um, and this project in many ways makes an intervention in three important areas. <coughs> the first is um, community archives, their practice um, and their preservation, um, digital preservation um, and content representation as well. Um, so community archives, digital preservation, content representation. But I suppose more broadly or perhaps significantly, it's also an attempt to bridge the gap between community archives and the digital preservation community. So to make sure that there's a dialogue in terms of maybe resource, resource sharing um, and also providing infrastructural advice and support. Um, just to give you a quick overview of the Sussex Humanities Lab, if you haven't heard of us, we're um, a research program. We're tasked with embedding digital humanities across the university within research and teaching. Um, we're a multidisciplinary team. We're located um, and embedded in different schools, um, but we work collaboratively together. Um, we lobby and advocate on behalf of the lab from within our departments and can initiate and develop digital humanities and or digital history programs as part of a wider program of development. So we're kind of beyond the schools that we're situated um, and so this British Academy grant that um, I'll talk to you about stems from my uh, background um, with Digital Repository of Ireland and also from the research that I've been doing with the um, Sussex Humanities Lab. And it's also, I suppose, from my engagement with LGBTQ plus communities in Brighton. Um, and when I moved to Brighton, learning about the various community projects that were um, De developed over the last number of decades, um, which have played an important role not only in curating and saving LGBTQ plus cultural heritage, but also advocating, challenging, and working with the glam sector on these issues in Brighton and Hove and, and kind of more broadly in Sussex. Um, and one of the, the, the projects that has come up in these conversations um, was a community archive called Brighton Our Story. I don't know if anyone here has heard of this. Um, but as a community archive, uh, Brighton Our Story ran uh, for about 24 years, from 1989 to 2013. And over the course of the 24 years, amassed a large collection of ephemera, oral history interviews, publication, photographs, um, and they also held exhibitions and created various publications related to um, LGBTQ plus uh, cultural heritage in Brighton. And 
the, the motivation, I suppose, for Brighton Our Story was prompted and motivated by what Tom Sargent, who was one of the co-founding members of Brighton Our Story, stated in an interview in the, in the late 2000s, was the Conservative 1988 law um, known as Section 28, which banned the promotion of homosexuality by local authorities and schools in the, o in the UK. So Brighton Our Story then was created um, both as an archive um, and in a way as a community hub. So a way to kind of bring um, a community that, that felt they were under attack together in a, in a positive way. So Section 28 brought about, as, as Sargent describes, a great sense of a culture under attack and of a need to put down roots strongly. So this archival need was prompted by legislation that tried to attack LGBT communities. But these communities, however, uh, reacted by creating positive alternative voices and narratives to, to those promoted and sanctioned by Thatcher's government. So this archival activism then is a key component of the strength and the need for grassroots archives uh, since they transmit positive counterpoints to dominant narratives. So they create representation, they create visibility and they they demand that society remembers. So in essence, then, is this exercise right to be represented, to be visible, is a reaction to historical systems of memory, of archives and record uh, keeping in the analogue world, which have in the past silenced or suppressed marginalised voices and communities um, from the historical record. So, for example, state building apparatus, um, like national archives and museums, in the past have projected a particular narrative um, to solidify a perceived national identity. And as Andrew Flynn, who has written extensively on the topic, states, in reality, um, the mainstream or formal archive sector does not contain or represent the voices of the non-elite, the grassroots, the marginalised. So Brighton, our story, like many community archives, was based on an inner community knowledge. It could gather authentic stories, um, authentic experiences, and the community was actively involved in the work of the archive, something that perhaps conventional archives can't really do in many respects or support. So it's for this reason, um, among other social, cultural, education, and of course legislative reasons, um, that I should ask that grassroots archives, DIY, community archives, have developed in various forms, across various geographical boundaries, across multiple cultural, societal and political lines. And possibly some of you um, know of this initiative anyway, the Community Archives and Heritage Group. Um, but um, this is a special interest group of the Archives and Records Association for UK and Ireland, and it has 500 officially registered um, community archives on the site. But in reality, there's probably more in the thousands of these types of archives. Um, but what this demonstrates then is community archives are omnipresent, they're widespread, and indeed they are required. In many cases, they provide alternative voices, alternative narratives, alternative historical records, which may not exist anywhere else. So they, they serve an important, um, um, yeah, they have an important uh, role to play. So Brighton Our Story then is just one uh, registered archive in this um, community group. And similar community archives listed here include the Cork LGBT archive, the Plymouth LGBT archive, the Feminist Web archive Manchester, the Ruckus Black LGBT archive in London, among many others. And a number of these are digital, or at least have a significant digital component. Um, community archives are, as you might expect, normally community-driven, whether a uh, community is defined by the local area or by a political or cultural, or even some culture affiliation, by heritage background, by gender politics, or indeed by sexual identity and politics. They are also normally community, um, and the majority of cases, voluntary-led. Um, so Brighton Our Story was community-led, driven and organised and relied on volunteers um, and it ran, as I said, until 2013. At that stage, it didn't, it had a significant, sorry, it had a significant web presence, although it wouldn't be what you might technically call the digital archive. Um, it, was, it was predominantly an analogue collection. But I use this case study to demonstrate the, the power of community archives and also their fragility and potential loss. So after 24 years, the physical archive ceased to exist. Objects, documents um, either went back to original donors, um, some uh, went to the Keep Archive, which is part of um, the University of Sussex and the East Sussex Records Office in Brighton. Some were destroyed and some um, went back to, as I said, original donors and some are still with the volunteers that led 
the, the community archive. But the legacy of Brighton Our Story and the community memory of this um, important collection persists. But since Brighton Our Story, um, a number of other projects and initiatives have taken place in Brighton. And one includes Queer in Brighton, which over the course of two years from 2012 to 2014, carried out um, 60 to 70 oral history interviews. They also collected um, written testimonies as well. And um, so they capture an important um, aspect of um, cultural heritage in Brighton, both from past and present members of the LGBTQ plus community. So Queer and Brighton also started collecting ephemera and have, had, and have used their website um, to publish some of the oral history transcripts um, until there was a takedown request um, from one of the original contributors. So uh, Queer and Brighton decided, actually, we'll just take everything down. So currently, none of that content is available. But looking beyond Brighton, however, we know that communities self-identified and self-acknowledged have, which have been traditionally absent from the formal narratives presented in official archives, use digital platforms as a means to represent and reconstruct their narratives of significance. And while some archives, like the Cork LGBT archive, have carried out an extensive program of digitization, many now also face a transition from collecting physical records um, which may or not have been digitized, to collecting temporary re contemporary records in a digital only or born digital form. Um, and many don't even realize that this is the next significant problem that they face. Um, many community archives are now using Facebook as a means to collect objects, collect um, uh, resources for the community and by the community. So the point is these alternative representations created by community archives to ensure representation, to ensure visibility, are at risk of loss because of the fragility of the human infrastructures, that is the volunteers, and the digital ones that support them. So I don't know if possibly most people in the room have seen this, but um, the Digital Preservation Coalition's uh, report last year um, the bit list listed community archives and community generated digital content as a critically endangered digital species. Um, and what that definition means is a blank slide. <laughs> is that digital materials are listed critically endangered where they face material technical challenges to preservation. There are no agencies responsible for them or those agencies are unwilling or unable to meet preservation needs. So I think in terms of kind of the community archives that exist and that are using things like Facebook, Twitter, or um, even you know creating their own WordPress and whatever site that is, um, they're not really sure where to go for support for maintaining the long-term preservation of their sites. Um, and some examples, and I use this to demonstrate in terms of the work that I'm doing with the various archives that I'm working with. So the examples that the DPC provide of some of these critically endangered are data of marginalized or subculture groups, um, one-off projects in art, heritage, environment, um, digital and digitized oral histories, recordings of BME oral histories. So you can see that they're you know exactly the content that I'm working with, and I'm you know the, the communities that I'm kind of engaged with at, um, at the moment. And as a DPC list as well. So the, the reasons for risk include lack of knowledge about the potential risks, lack of resources, lack of adequate funding, or no access to digital preservation infrastructures. So to highlight this, I applied for um, British Academy funding last year, and I'm now halfway through, or three quarters of the way through, a 12-month research project that has tried to highlight the problem of long-term digital preservation in community archives. So I'm working closely with the Queer and Brighton Project and the Brighton Digital Festival on issues that have arisen, especially around safeguarding these oral history testimonies. Um, and at a workshop related to this project in June of this year, which Paul attended and spoke eloquently at. Um, community archives managers gathered and spoke openly about their um, about their motivations and frustrations, their challenges and their opportunities. That they share their insights and their anxieties, and some cited similar problems as those identified by the DPC. Um, I'll come back to this slide actually, maybe in a few minutes, but that's just a kind of outline of the the projects or the 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 events that I've been running for this British Academy um, grant. 
So speaking to these um, archive managers or volunteers, they, they cited the burden of low, no or low budget or inadequate funding streams which have um, have no plan for the aftercare of collections. So, so something like the Heritage Lottery Fund, where they have, and this is, was essentially the problem that Queer and Brighton found themselves in, that they had gotten a, 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 a chunk of money to carry out the oral histories, to um, bring together volunteers to support those ty type of activities. But at the end of that project, they had no money to catalogue it, to put it anywhere, to store it securely. So essentially, it's a hard drive, which is now sitting in my office. Um, they also stated lack of skills or adequate training, not knowing which was the right technology choice. So people who are running um, community archives had asked us in 2000, we didn't know whether or not we should choose access as a database to use. And they were like, well, we're still using that. Should we use something else? Another person asked about WordPress. Is that safe to use for our current websites or, or what might be the alternative? So just not knowing where to go with these questions was one of the big things that they cited. And also the challenge of keeping up with technology and implementing systems that last. So thinking about those things with little or no training or little or no support. Often people working in isolation um, um, on their own and, and trying to kind of maintain these systems. Um, I think one of the biggest problems as well, which was mentioned in that session in June, was that one gatekeeper existed for some of these collections, one gatekeeper for the entire digital collection. And, and this was especially true of the Cork LGBT archive. Orly Egan was very um, open about the frustrations that she's had. Um, so she was saying that she's the only one with the password for her digital archive, and that really instills fear and anxiety in her on a regular basis. Um, and I also thought it was quite interesting, um, so Topher Campbell, who was talking about the Ruckus Archive, he mentioned well, uh, a quote from William Bl Blake, and his idea about kind of like the systems that community archives use or um, marginalised communities use, um, and kind of maybe uh, pushing against that, he, 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 may, he said, I must create a system or be enslaved by another man's. So thinking about kind of what we expect people to use or what we think they might be able to use and actually wh what their pushback is, I think that's quite important as well. I told Paul that I was going to mention them here, so Paul tweeted <laughs> um, on that day, and uh, as a digital preservation community, I think it's, it's something that we know, that you know, technology is only a third of the problem in digital preservation. The other challenges are organisation and resource, and, and often these are the most challenging. And I think that was the biggest thing that came out in, in that, in that two-day event, was that, you know, the will is there, but there often it's the organisational structures that aren't there, it's the resources that, that isn't there, and, uh, you know, it's the kind of the, the future planning that um, individuals might not, might not know about. I mean, I think it's also another thing to remember as well uh, is the use of language so when we were talking about maybe digital preservation trusted digital repositories migration and members of community archives were like oh i don't know what that is you know and, and and just not even knowing the question to ask or you know to be able to do research around this um and then relying on third-party services was one thing that came up as well um so some of you have, might have already seen this, but you know that, that third-party services like Flickr, like Twitter, like Facebook change their terms and conditions. They change their terms of use on a regular basis. So Flickr, over the last month, I think it was in November they announced that they were changing their, um, their limits for free users. Um, so there's many community archives that have used Flickr as a, as a way to publish their um, uh, photographs, um, their ephemera, um, and now face a challenge in terms of maybe well, they might be deleted if it's not CC BY. So I, I think for me, th I mean, the crucial thing here is there's a real danger that we are replicating systems of um, suppression, systematic forgetfulness within our digital environments. Um, so while there is an autonomy and agency which gives community archives their power, in some cases, this characteristic may also be their major downfall, especially in terms of digital material and digital archives. So what, therefore, are the implications of a community-driven approach to long-term sustainability of these constructed and reconstructed narratives? And how might we support community archives with their endeavours without removing their agency? So working with Queer and Brighton, with the DPC, um, with Brighton Digital Festival and with Sussex Humanities Lab, I hope to continue working on some of these solutions. 
but it's not an easy task. And I suppose the first task is highlighting this issue, stating the problem, and then working from there. Um, we want to unlock the resources that we have access to, to share knowledge, to share skills, and in many ways to share the burden. So um, Adam is here from the University Library in, at Sussex, and you know we're working, um, myself as a researcher, and working with Career in Brighton and with the library, are working to think about kind of you know a pilot project using Atom, um, supported by ITS, um, which Queer and Brighton will have ownership of. We're, you know, we're kind of really taking seriously this idea that it's the power of the community archives is their agency and their ability to be able to run that themselves. So we, we don't want to swoop in as an institution and go, we'll have all this stuff and we'll mind it. We want them to have control over that. Um, so unlocking those resources, creating that conversation and creating that dialogue. I suppose this is, um, to kind of finish off um, with just thinking about one of the, the last um, event that I had was around queer archiving, recommissioning oral, the queer oral history, um, oral histories. And one of the things that kind of came out of that project where we were thinking about how we might make this available, I was getting members of the community to, to listen to these oral histories and to write metadata for it. So kind of developing skills within the community. So we were doing a very simple Dublin Core um, Google form where they could think about you know, the fields that that might be required. Um, and what happened within that was actually quite a nice thing of you know, ways of listening to so the importance of these collections. So I just used audio splitters, um, so people were listening together to these oral histories. So rather than just listening in isolation and writing metadata, there was a kind of a collective listening. And what that really brought to the fore was maybe unconscious bias in the way people were listening to these oral histories. Um, and then ways of archiving as well. There were how, you know, listening together and kind of thinking of that community engagement in terms of that metadata creation was a way of actually capturing emotion as well, to kind of capture it reaction. So the writing together, writing metadata, data as community memory uh, as community members was quite powerful as well um, and I'm definitely all about metadata standards you know being with DRI and we, we you know we wrote various metadata um, handbooks so but I also wanted people to challenge metadata standards within that within that um, framework as well because we were thinking about control vocabularies and perhaps how restrictive they might be in terms of various communities and how they identify so Currently, uh, the Queer and Brighton Archive, in inverted commas, is sitting in my office. So whether or not it's as, is safe at the moment, you know, it was in a basement of a pub up until two months ago. Um, but for me anyway, and I use this as a kind of, um, th with different presentations that I've done around this, was that, you know, the oral histories are sitting on a hard drive. Um, that's the top object there. And as people in the room know, that is the most fragile object in that collection. Um, so this is, a, this is the kind of th the objects that we are, are working through at the moment. Um, and we will be having another exhibition, or we will have an exhibition in February um, that will use the oral histories in a different way. So not just a digital archive, thinking about reuse in a different way. So it will be an installation in the library. And um, there will be an interactive object where people will get snippets of that archive. Um, and then just kind of creating momentum in terms of community engagement, institutional engagement um, around community archives and their problem with digital preservation. So I think that was it. Am I mic'd? Yes, of course. Um, so I just wanted to jump in here before between speakers um, to thank Sharon um, for really laying a groundwork for I think the bigger discussion of what today is about. Uh, definitely thought that was interesting and to reiterate how many community archives um, have resorted or have chosen Facebook um, and Facebook groups as the location to collect um, and share resources and their own sort of community materials and histories um, and how vulnerable that content is um, sort of trapped, for lack of a better word, on third party systems. Um, I also realized that I forgot to tell you uh, sort of the health and safety things for today. Um, so I don't want you all to burn in a fire. So just to say, if the fire alarm goes off, um, I can reassure you it is not a test, it is the real thing. So we will go out this door. So everyone on this side of the room has chosen well. We'll go around the corner up the main stairs 
If the main doors are working, we will go through those. If not, we will go out through the side entrance to the designated smoker area, left and left again to the flower shop. Um, but I think if we just follow everybody who looks like they know what they're doing, we'll be fine. If you have not found them already, there are toilets out to the right over here. Um, if those are taken, there are more toilets by the lift if you need them. Um, if we do have a smoker in the room, if you didn't pass it coming in, there is a designated smoking area. Otherwise, no other smoking anywhere in the building. Uh, and uh, I already announced about the vegan biscuits. Just to say, the um, there are two different groups uh, downstairs today, us and then some um, training going on next door. So the food sort of in front of us to the left is ours. So I, I felt that was probably obvious, but I was asked to mention that. Um, and you're more than welcome to say if you see a stranger trying to take our food to let them know that that is our food and their food is on the other side. Um, so with that, I will hand you over to Nicola Bingham and Helena Byrne of the UK Web Archive. So I just want to apologise to everyone that's for being late. That's not us. Oh, I know maybe it is, but not the beginning. Um, my mobile data was not working today, so I got very lost on my way. <laughs> really? Okay, yeah. I got yeah, oh, yeah, that's it. So I wasn't sure if it was just me, but I asked somebody else for directions and had the same problem. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, thank you. So um, I'm just going to give a little bit of background about the UK Web Archive um, to put us in context and then say a little bit about our collection development policies. I'm going to um, touch on um, more of the policy space and ethical issues um, regarding uh, social media. Helena is going to talk uh, a little bit more about the practical aspects of, of archiving social media. So, uh, the British Library has been archiving websites on a small scale selective basis since 2004, with the explicit permission of website publishers. So from 2004 to 2013, this process resulted in a data set of about 15,000 websites, um, which are made available through our website, which we call the Open UK Web Archive. In April 2013, there was a big step change in our operations as legal deposit legislation was extended to include websites. So this placed an obligation on the British Library and the UK Legal Deposit Libraries to collect the UK web at scale. And, and I should say that the UK Web Archive is a partnership of the UK Legal Deposit Libraries, the British Library, the National Libraries of Scotland and Wales, Trinity College Dublin, Bodleian Libraries Oxford and Cambridge University Library. Um, we've then been performing broad domain crawls of the UK web space since April 2013, where when the legislation came into effect. Th so there's a slide with some numbers here which shows you the, the scale of the operation. So this is to sort of put us in a sharp uh, contrast with the community um, archives that Sharon has just been talking about, we're acquiring on an annual basis about five to 10 million hosts. This is over 2 billion items, um, 70 to 100 terabytes of compressed data. So far, we think that we have about 470 terabytes of, of compressed data. So uh, a little bit about the non-print legal deposit regulations. Our collection development policy is essentially framed by the regulations. The, the regulations allow us to collect online works published in the UK. They're in scope for legal deposit if they meet the, the following criteria. 
are made available to the public from a website with a UK top level domain name or they are made available to the public by a person and any of that person's activities relating to the creation or the publication of the work take place within the UK. In, in practice, the way that we implement this at scale is that we can automatically scope in websites that are on a UK top level domain name. So this would be .uk.scot.cumru or we can identify through a GOIP lookup websites that are physically hosted on servers in the UK. This of course leaves a massive tranche of, of data that we're not collecting automatically, that content which is on .coms or other domain names. If those websites are considered UK, they are in scope for us and we can archive them, but it needs manual identification. So a curator has to look at a website and say, yes, we believe this is a, a UK website. There's evidence of a postal address or we've communicated with, um, with uh, the, the, the publisher. Um, so what is out of scope for us? Uh, this, so this is in the, the terms of the, the legislation. Sites where the, the function of the site is predominantly an audio or visual platform. So this would be YouTube channels or BBC iPlayer. Uh, we can archive websites where videos are embedded into the website, but there's quite um, a detailed explanation of, of, what of, of when the, the video is considered incidental to the, the website. Um, we don't archive uh, private intranets and emails. We only archived published uh, material. Uh, we don't archive personal data in social networking sites or um, social media content that is available to restricted groups. And so as we'll explore later, this is a very grey area. So what is considered published on social networks and what is considered private is, is this, there's not really a clear legal definition and even in the, the eyes of the content creators, this is probably um, not, not very clear. Uh, in terms of social media platforms, what we're archiving at the moment, um, they're, uh, apart from our um, legislative framework, there are technical issues, which means that we can't archive all platforms or some platforms are easier for us to, to archive than, than others. So Facebook is very, very locked down. There, there was a point where we were able to archive some Facebook um, content, um, but Facebook is always a few steps um, ahead and they're, they're very, very um, reluctant to uh, allow uh, crawler access. Um, with YouTube videos, as I say, we are um, able to collect selected YouTube um, videos. We've had very varying degrees of success with, uh, with collecting uh, YouTube videos. One of our issues is that because we are geared up to do bulk crawling, we do whole domain crawling, our tool set is geared up to um, collect broadly rather than high fidelity crawl such as a uh, web recorder or social feed manager um, handle so social media a lot better. So we don't have um, tools that are modular enough to allow us to successfully archive video. Um, we are looking at implementing uh, br the our, uh, a browser crawler, so this is a browser-based um, crawler, but this is something that we'd have to be very, very selective about. Uh, we'd have to um, allocate resource to a curator to say, these videos are important, um, and so that we'd spend um, extra extra time curating those videos. We have a second layer of problems is in that the acquiring of content is actually relatively easy, but the playback of content adds another layer of complexity. So the software that we're using for playing back um, our web archives at the moment is um, a JavaScript-based version of the, the Wayback software. We're moving over to the Python based version of the, uh, the, uh, the Wayback software, but this isn't allowing us to, to render um, videos at the moment. So this is a, 
this is something that we're going to have to address before we can um, collect uh, videos successfully. Uh, so, so Twitter, um, as you're probably uh, aware, is, is slightly more friendly. The terms and conditions of the Twitter uh, platform are a little bit more accessible. Twitter API is, is quite user friendly. So we have um, a little bit more success with archiving, um, with archiving Twitter. Uh, in terms of our uh, collection development policy for, for social media, as I say, we're archiving it on a selective basis. So we're archiving a very small handful of social media accounts. This is usually for a special collection. So in addition to our broad whole domain crawlings, we um, archive around particular thematic events. So we might, for example, look at political events, UK general elections, we've been um, quite involved in archiving uh, the EU referendum and Brexit uh, debates at, at the moment. Um, so certain important social media accounts, we'll put the effort in and archive them if they're related to a special collection. Or perhaps for um, significant UK um, figures, for example, the um, Twitter account of 10 Downing Street and, and the, the Prime Minister. Uh, as I said, the difficulty with social media is that they, they all have to be uh, manually identified and, and scoped in. Um, currently, there's various staff across the legal deposit libraries that are doing the selection within their own areas of, of interest. But we're trying to do much, much more in reaching out to those communities that are creating the, the, the content so that we firstly reflect underrepresented um, communities um, and we, we, we secondly sort of contract the subject expertise in those areas that, that we're not necessarily the, the experts um, in. So for example with our BA, uh, BM um, Black Asian minority ethnic um, collections we're reaching out to appropriate communities there so that they can tell us what we should be um, collecting. But it's it's a very, very um, sort of small scale operation at the moment. We occasionally have um, re requests of, if you like, a, a voluntary um, deposit. So this would be perhaps more of a records management function. So some institutions have asked us, could we archive their um, official um, Twitter accounts? So we're certainly very, very happy to do that. Uh, with regards to ethical considerations, there's, there's obviously extra cautions needed when archiving uh, social media. As I said, we don't archive private data, so we don't archive those social media accounts that constitute a private member's forum or direct messaging, but we do deliberately archive data that is personal. So this is the material that the researchers currently and in the future are um, asking us uh, about. So this sort of information when anonymized and when aggregated is, is absolutely what the, the researchers need. Um, and we feel that f uh, for those researchers studying life in contemporary Britain, it's going to be very difficult for them to, to do this without having access to, to this kind of, of data. So we do um, deliberately collect personal data. At the same time, we have um, a duty to protect the uh, person's privacy and make sure information that's potentially sensitive and potentially harmful um, is not freely uh, available. Um, regarding personal and data privacy, there's currently no specific and legal right to be forgotten beyond the general data protection regulations and the UK Data Protection Act, which put in, pr pu put in place provisions for um, the protection of, of personal data that could cause substantial damage and, and distress. But there isn't a legal basis by which an individual can ask for material to be deleted if it's been lawfully, lawfully archived in the first place. 
uh, and as a public body, the UK legal deposit libraries have derogation from the right to erasure under the following terms. In order to comply with a legal obligation for the performance of a task carried out in the public interest and for archiving purposes. But aside from this legal environment, there are also ethical considerations to, to take into account. So we have to be very, very careful um, with personal data and we mitigate the, the risk of um, exposing sensitive personal data by being selective about what we archive in the first place. Secondly, through controlling access. So the default position um, for the UK web archive data is reading room only access. There's a very small subset of data that we make publicly available and that is with the consent of the website um, publishers and we have quite a robust notice and takedown policy if we mistakenly uh, publish uh, a potentially uh, damaging um, uh, sensitive data. Um, this is, um, I don't think you'll be able to, to read the, 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 the text, but this is basically a data uh, checklist and our general uh, principles which we, um, wh which we look to when considering notice and takedown uh, requests. So this is just to say that there's certain circumstances where we would give data particularly s um, special considerations. So if material had been published about a child or being published by a child um, or by vulnerable persons, um, for example, this data would uh, be more likely to be redacted if it was, if it was, um, if it was published. We're also we're, we're hitting the generation now where um, um, children have, have grown up with adults posting, for example, photographs about them and they um, haven't necessarily had any control over that publishing process and what happens um, when their, um, for example, um, situations um, change when they, when they are um, an adult. Um, also, if material has perhaps been um, leaked or maliciously post, uh, posted online uh, without the data subject's consent, um, we would look at it in a, in a more um, cautious, cautious way. Uh, but we also, as, um, as, as the library, want to um, protect the public record and to hold public figures to accountability. So we might look differently, for example, on um, people who had posted if they had a, a public uh, role um, or if that information had been in the public for a very long period of, of time. Um, so this is not a very sort of precise formula at the moment and it's still uh, evolving, but I was just wanting to, um, to, to highlight some of the, the issues that come into play here with uh, personal data. Uh, and this is my um, last point. I touched on it um, a, a minute um, or two um, ago. So uh, it, it under um, our um, strategic um, framework, the, the legal deposits libraries acquire and make available material that is published. Um, so we're trying to do a bit of work about understanding what is considered published and what is considered private data in the context of the of the web and and, and social media. Um, there is the the Department of uh, Digital Culture Media Spot does have some some guidelines uh, about this. They're, they're helpful but not massively helpful, and, and they define private data as that which is only available to a restricted group of persons. Works behind a barrier such as user credentials are actually considered open. So if you have to input your email address to, to access a website, that material is still considered published, open data, and the legal deposit libraries can acquire it. But as, as I say, what do we... Um, understand about how the public perceives this space. So if a person is um, posting to a public message board and the, the screen shot here is a post on the, the Mumsnet uh, website. Mumsnet is a 
massive research um, importance here. The issue here is that the poster is marked with the way that people are spelling Paralympics or Paralympics. But th there's, there's a, a, a wealth of information on, on mums. Net, so, so we feel that the, the comments on this, this site is really, really val valuable information to preserve. But not very much research has been done about how people contributing to forums such as this um, uh, it, it, you know, see themselves um, as, as publishing. And, and even if they do sort of appreciate that the comments are going out to the public web, how aware are they of organisations such as the British Library that are going to be preser preserving this information in, in perpetuity? Um, so that's just to, to sort of uh, set down the point about this grey area, about what is considered published and what is considered private um, in, in social media, perhaps for further discussion. And that's about me. Okay, so I'm just going to run through uh, the quick steps of the process of web archiving and then go through some of the challenges of that process and then talk about how you can get involved. So, um, first we identify targets that websites that are in UK scope for capture. Then we send out our crawl bots. Then we download into WARC files. So WARC is the file format for archived websites. Then we index the collection. So we've got full text index, so you can search across the whole um, archive. And then we play back via um, the website interface. So that's our, um, our website address there. And then we carry out quality assurance on some content. And then we request open access license for some websites. And OK, so we're into the first uh, challenge. OK, so identifying. This is really, really hard. So we have like, we can scope in all the UK top level domains, as Nicola had mentioned before, and everything hosted in the UK. But there's so much more out there that's not published on uh, a U in one of those uh, forms. So we have to manually identify this content and add it to the archive. So I mean, these are just three, like WordPress has got many different uh, top level domains as well. And then twitter.com, uh, it's all hosted outside of the UK. So we have to manually identify UK published content. And that can be quite challenging because people don't always say they're based in the UK or have a flag or something like that, or an address. So then we send out our crawl bots. So as Nicola mentioned, um, it's quite challenging to get uh, high fidelity captures of things like social media and other kind of really dynamic web content because we're going to use hair tricks, which is great for large scale crawling, but not so good for uh, kind of bespoke websites. And uh, you're going to hear later today about Web Recorder and Social Feed Manager. Um, those kind of more, it's better for those individual uh, content. Then um, we download the websites into work files. And although we've experimented a little bit with Web Recorder and Social Feed Manager, it's quite challenging for us to ingest that into our archive and how we integrate that into our system as well for metadata and making access. So uh, although we'd like to implement these things, it's going to be a while before we can um, implement it into their workflow. So then playback, this is, uh, so I've skipped four because indexing, there's no issue across uh, content. Uh, so number five was playback. And this is quite challenging because the technology for capturing web content is very different to the technology for playing it back so that you can view it. And we, um, uh, through our website, it should look and feel how's it, as it did originally. W the hair tricks can only fo um, follow clickable links. So search boxes don't work. But as long as you can click through to content, we should be able to get it. So uh, this is a, an Eventbrite page from the live web. And you can see it's got a nice image and stuff on it. And in our old website, so our new website was only launched a couple of weeks ago. On the old website, we used Open Way Back. And you can see the images were missing. So before, we weren't sure, like, did we just not capture it? Or is it just not playing back? There was no way to really tell. Was it the technology for playing back? Or was it the archive uh, technology? But in our new system, now we're using Python way back. And you can see, actually, we do have the images. So it's just an issue with the playback software. Um, but at the moment, uh, this is our current display of Twitter accounts. And I think WordPress blogs look a little bit like this as well. So it's not that we haven't captured the content. As Nicola mentioned, we have a lot of legal um, uh, restrictions on making content accessible outside of a reading room. So with a lot of web archives, they either have the majority open access, small amount, closed access. We're quite unique. We have the majority um, closed access and a little bit open access, because mostly it's either closed or open. 
And um, so this is a whitelisting issue. So we have to whitelist content to make it accessible. But websites like Twitter and WordPress and stuff, they use this third party content to kind of uh, give the the kind of the visual the images and the style sheets and stuff. But if we make that open accessible at the moment, we're not sure if we can guarantee that it's not going to make other content that we don't have open access permission for accessible. So we're just kind of in that um, transition phase from implementing the new service and kind of working out these kind of um, issues that we have. So if you do see this, don't worry, we do have the content. It's just not visible at the moment, but we are working on it. So uh, qu carrying out quality assurance. So it's very difficult. We've got such a large scale of content to actually look at everything because that's all we have at the moment. Our uh, QA process is just visually comparing the archive content to the live web and then actually identifying issues on how the website is developed um, as the reasons why we haven't captured stuff. So there's very little um, work we can do to kind of remedy it. Sometimes we can implement some things like adding additional seeds to the record, um, but there is very little we can do manually. And um, so requesting open access is very difficult. A lot of people don't give contact details anymore. They don't have addresses. Uh, they if even if they do have an address, they may not have an email address. So we uh, just send an automated email through our web archivist email account, and it goes directly to the address that we get online. But also most websites only give a general generic info address, and it, it looks like spam. So we're contact them, we're the UK Web Archive, most people have never heard of us. So uh, they just ignore it or um, it goes straight to their spam folder, they don't even see it. So it's quite challenging on that case. And then also sometimes people just reply and say, yes, that's okay, but don't actually fill in the form. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so our return rate in general is about 20% roughly, but sometimes with some uh, special collect curated collections, we make a special effort and where we actually call up everyone um, personally send personal emails and then we might get a return rate of maybe closer to 40% but it's still quite limited and some people can't give us open access requests even if they want to because uh, they've used third party copyright images and they don't have it as part of their license that they can uh, make it open access. And then also medical um, advice websites, because medical advice is always changing, they don't want it, older advice to be more accessible as well. And then um, sometimes at big organizations, they don't know who to ask for this permission because we're the only people asking them. So it's kind of a difficult question. And then so as Sharon mentioned as well, um, like community-based websites are uh, at risk. And um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a knowledge gap um, on how to actually make things more archivable. And then also um, there is a financial gap as well. So for this example here, the Football Collective, it's a WordPress site, so but they were able to manage to get a UK top level domain. But lots of other people can't afford to get a UK top level domain as well. And then in this example, they have a lot of video and audio content, but it's all on YouTube, SoundCloud and iTunes. So that's not archivable. So um, it's about kind of getting the message out. Um, I, um, I think I have it in a different post, but we have tips and stuff like that for how to make your website more archivable. Um, so it's just about getting the information out there and then kind of helping them to find the steps on how to actually um, make this more accessible for the archive. So we would recommend keep the SoundCloud and iTunes, but just have the content embedded also to the website because if it's embedded to it, it's easier for us to collect because um, a lot of, as Nicola mentioned with social media, it's the same with all cloud storage as well. Um, ro they block robots from getting into their content. So even if it is open access for everyone to get uh, when you're on the live web, they block ro um, the crawlers for archiving it as well as other kind of bad crawlers. Um, so a few tips on how to make something more archivable is to ensure that video and audio content is not coming from somewhere else so that you've embedded it into the site. Um, so if you've got a database driven site, make sure you've got a site map because we can only follow clickable links. So if you have to do a search to find that content, the crawler is never going to get there because it can't follow the trail. And um, so with robots.txt, you can exclude things like calendars are really big crawler traps because calendars never end. When the crawler goes in there, it can go on forever. So then it gets stuck and it causes problems for your website and also causes problems for the general crawler as well. And that's the blog post I just mentioned with some tips. And um, I'm sure Sarah will share the slides and stuff afterwards as well. Um, so there's also this other great website that was developed by the Web Archive communities, archiveready.com. So you can put your URL in and just check how archive ready you are. And then it will give you some indication about where 
uh, your problems might be, but not all websites can be 100% archivable because this is the British Library website and 84% is pretty good. But we have a catalogue, an online catalogue, and that's search interaction as well. There's lots of dynamic stuff that you need there that we're never going to be able to capture and we don't need to capture either. So it's just about finding the balance of like if you've got documents that it can be archived and accessed as well because we don't want to shape how people publish but we also need to be able to capture a record of that as well. So it's kind of finding the happy medium. So you can get involved. We're always looking for volunteers to get involved. Um, so you can save a UK website. So on our website, we have a save a UK website tab and you can just fill in the information there. It's just a few simple steps with the URL contact details as well um, if you're the site owner. So we can pass you on the open access permission form. And we save anything. We don't pass any judgment on the quality of the content we, um, because we leave that that's up for the end user to do in their analysis. We just want to archive UK published content. So it just has to be anything UK. So some of um, the sites we have, uh, there's an online enthusiast collection and one of the websites is the Carpets of Witherspoons. So uh, it, it's quite an electric, uh, eclectic mix of uh, content we have in the archive. We've got a little bit of everything. So, and that's good because it represents what's going on in the UK. So, but if your content's from outside the UK, you can also nominate with the UK, uh, with the Internet Archive, they have a save a page now. And there's a few other uh, web archives that also take um, public nominations as well. So the Portuguese Web Archive does it also. And um, we want to work more with the Living Knowledge Network, which is uh, working, the national libraries, working with local libraries, and then getting more involved in the communities. So we are hoping to have more um, um, so, uh, support materials for people getting involved in web archiving because there's only a few of us on our team even though we are one of the biggest UK web, ar uh, web archive teams in the world there's only a few of us and the UK is so big and so diverse we need to get more uh, subject experts involved and it's also people in local libraries are more um, up to date with what's going on locally as well so we can get more community-based groups represented in the archive as well so um, we need you so you can save a website uh, you can create a collection if you want to get in touch with us to curate a collection as well. We're always open to working with subject experts. And subject experts don't need to be academics. They can be just anybody who knows a lot about a subject. And um, so, and I want you to ask five friends if they know a website that they can be saved. So you've got some homework. <laughs> so uh, we're hoping to see more uh, nominations next week and when we check our email. <laughs> And uh, so when you fill in the form, it just goes to um, uh, the Web Archivist email account, gets monitored by our assistant Web Archivist, and we just assess if it's UK published or not, and then we add it to the archive. So it's a very simple process. And these are some useful links as well. So it's to our website, to our blog, which has lots of information about work, some collections we're working on, but also a lot of blogs by our technical lead, An Andy Jackson, about explaining the processes and the things in a really accessible way. So you don't need to be a technical expert to understand how the process of web archiving works. And then we've got a few little short videos. And then Shine is another data set that was everything.uk archived by the Internet Archive from 96 to when our non-print legal deposit regulations came into effect in April 2013. And you could search across that as well. And then we have some data sets that you can just you can do some big data analysis with. And they're all open access. OK, so that's us. And I will be following up with everybody later to make sure everyone has, has told five friends to nominate to Save a, save a UK um, website. So thank you very much to uh, Helena and Nicola. Um, I do hope um, that you consider using some of the bigger institutions like the British Library and the Internet Archive um, to support web archiving for websites and web content and that perhaps you don't currently have the infrastructure to capture yourself. Um, and just also a point uh, I wanted to pull out um, I felt was uh, sort of <coughs> uh, touched on during um, Nicola and Helena's presentation um, is in particular the difficulty of capturing those high fidelity um, um, copies or, or records of social media and websites for specific identified individuals or groups um, that the tools, um, bespoke tools needed to collect those are quite a challenge uh, and that this is another motivation to make sure you are empowering the communities and individuals themselves with the tools that they need to identify that material and archive it um, for themselves. Um, so I will stop talking and I will hand over to Anissa Haas and uh, to talk about another case study of using different approaches uh, for capturing web and social media content. Thank you. 
Okay, is this is this working? It's really big on my head. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope it doesn't fall off. My ears aren't large enough. Um Thanks for inviting me, Sarah. Um so in this um short session, I'm going to share some reflections about um some work I did between 2015 and 2018 while I was based in the prints department at the Victoria and Albert Museum. I led a project um, called Collecting and Curating Digital Posters. It was a collaborative research project activated by the Posters Subject Specialist Network and um, supported by the Arts Council England. Um, during that time, I worked closely with organisations including the DPC and the British Library UK Web Archive, as well as Rhizome, um, who I'm going to talk a bit about. Um, I'm going to talk, well, I'm going to talk a lot about the tool that they've developed later on today. Um, I worked with these organisations to test web archiving technologies for capturing digital posters within the context of the platforms where they are created and encountered. As we started to sort of consider the development of the poster within the interactive platforms of Web 2.0, what became really interesting was not the individual image, but rather something we, beca um, we, we came to think of as a, um, a meme or a graphic event sort of how a graphic is shared and commented on and how it's adapted by multiple users. We began to ask questions about how we could collect an object that is embedded within a networked environment where meaning is created through an aggregation of, um, an aggregation of parts, sort of um, meaning being created through iterations and through interactions. On social media, the process through which an image circulates and gains traction is accelerated, and we can actually witness it unfolding. Um, it was this which prompted us to explore methods for collecting digital posters in situ and to begin thinking of the graphic event itself as the object. The defining characteristics of the graphic meme, meme are that it is based on participation and it's produced by processes of appropriation and, re and representation. So it wouldn't make sense to isolate one of its um, individual manifestations. It's actually the digital poster's um, kind of innate mutability that allows it to adapt very quickly and it also um, we sort of noticed that the, the opportunities for manipulating graphic images are becoming ever more accessible. So really looking at that um, yeah, mutability and multi multiplicity of the object. Social media used to be an arena for circulation with the actual graphic production happening elsewhere. But now platforms have built-in graphic design tools, filters, captions, emojis, stickers... Um, these um, platforms have now also become space spaces of graphic creation. The meme emerges through collective activity and propelled by news feeds and hashtags, each new iteration feeds back into the conversation or event. Um, the concept, really, of the meme implies that it's this piece of media in action, something that's spreading from person to person and evolving as it travels, these qualities of participation, collective creation and live interaction challenge the traditional idea of the museum object as something discrete, static and individually authored. The meme requires us to shift our attention towards the interactions of multiple distributed actors and those who as well, um, yeah, thinking about those who appropriate, those who redistribute, and those who comment on graphics. So we dis we're, we're discovering a new, a new kind of creation. The format of the meme offers us a new opportunity as well for tracing the impact um, of a graphic. Traditionally, curators have struggled to find first-hand inscribed 
evidence of the encounter between poster and viewer, but now online memes are imprinted with metadata, um, rec which records kind of responses, comments, threads, and gives tallies of the views, the likes, and the shares. Um, it becomes clear that the work exists less as a clearly defined thing and more as a constellation of images in relationships. So to download even one iteration or perhaps a, a kind of cache of JPEGs would be a misrepresentation. It would fail to reveal the networked environment on which the meme depends and we'd lose the very aspect of the work that makes it most interesting. Um, so the meme and the platforms through which it circulates are inherently interwoven and we're tasked with, the, um, with collecting the digital poster together with part of its environment and that's something that the traditional paper um, poster printed on paper refused us because we couldn't collect the poster in the street together. Um, so, yeah, it's this... Um, it's this acknowledgement that um, Helene has mentioned that you know complex, dynamic content on social media requires direct interaction. So we have to um, scroll to load or click to play, and these things really prove an obstacle to the automated crawlers, um, very often used for archiving. Rhizome's web recorder, however, makes it possible to capture those active objects because it's curator operated we can actually um, enact those interactions which stimulate and reveal the functionality um, it invites us to follow links and hop across websites thresholds um, and capture elements of a meme or graphic which are distributed across different platforms it's an int it's interesting and it's important to know also that the curator or archivist themselves therefore gains a more active presence within the material collected because during capture we're actually making decisions about which components, which contexts and which traces will represent um, a meaningful whole. So I would say that um, collecting becomes a performative act. Um, we're also involved in, the yeah, also involving... Uh, drawing a boundary around the digital object. So we're, f we're familiar with the curatorial activity of se selecting something to collect, but now we find ourselves having to define the edges of the object as we're collecting it. And what we collect will reflect our vantage point, our decisions and our actions. Um, so subjectivity becomes embedded within the process, not only through our decisions, but also because the fact is that the way we experience the web is defined by our past behaviours, our settings, our search histories. So an object collected from the web is very critically shaped by the person who captures it. Um, I'm just going to um, spend the next uh, portion of the presentation kind of honing in on two of the case studies and, and just... Um, yeah, really explaining the methods I use to capture um, the objects, which I hope will be useful. So, my David Cameron is one of several projects which we investigated under this framework of graphic event. Rather than um, a single work of design, it comprises an assemblage of meme images that appropriated one of the official Conservative Party posters that was printed as part of the um, billboard campaign for the 2010 general election. The term graphic event is useful because it enables us to fuse together that assemblage of memes with the social processes by which the post image was replicated, remixed and redistributed online um, through a series of changes and via the repeated actions of exchange. This pretty unremarkable poster actually caught, uh, caught our attention and made us interested. Um, many of the um, memes that were produced were based on a typographically bare 
um, template, just a, a JPEG file that was um, created by the designer Clifford Singer. Web users could drag and drop the file from his site, then rewrite it and augment it offline using image editing tools on their own computers. Um, other posters um, were made using an online generator tool that was developed by um, the technologist Andy Barefoot. Um, Clifford Singer um, created a kind of combined selection um, of the posters in a gallery on his website, which you see a, a view of here. Um, the origin, I think, of these appropriations can really be traced back to physical acts of graffiti in the urban environment. Um, photographs of um, graffitied billboards um, had, had already kind of caught the attention of the media and had begun circulating on the web. Yet, transposed to the online realm, they began to trigger a kind of unfamiliar current of um, graphic destruction. With digital tools on hand, the gesture of appropriation becomes swift, um, anonymized, and legal rather than a risky and prosecutable act. The My David Cameron phenomenon um, sort of took a, a, th a form like a humorous contest or a, a call and response between poster makers. Um, it's important to say that this case study object dates from 2010, which was before platforms such as Twitter claimed their dominance in contemporary culture. At that time, digital design was much more likely to be published on a blog or collated on a website um, than, than posted on social media. So it was it was appropriate for the era that Clifford Singer took the initiative to set up a website and publish and gather his and others um, digital remakes of the poster. So pre-social media's omnipresence, we note that the tendency was for images to assemble on these single sites rather than to disperse. And in this case, the website, as distinct from the networking platform, can be kind of investigated as the hub of the graphic event activity. Um, we'd learned already that our partners at the British Library had captured several instances of mydavidcameron.com as part of their legal deposit collection. Um, so our aim was to draw... Um, a different kind of connection between the memes, the meme images that are assembled on this site and the poster generator um, elsewhere online with which many of them were constructed. Web recorders' capacity to combine several archival captures with static snapshots enabled us to show how the generator actually works. Um, the generator, I'm just going to show you the same slide again. You've seen this one, but um, just to show you. So the, the generator comprises the template um, image with a sequence of text input fields where users can type their slogan in and, and click, then click the button to generate the poster. But the live text fields render the generator really complex to capture, even using a tool like Web Recorder. When the text is entered into the fields, what cha what, what's changing is the, um, the view state of the page, not the page itself. So while the curator sees on their computer that the screen has altered, um, the textual information doesn't actually form part of what is being exchanged between the browser and the web server during the archiving process. So when the capture is recalled, the fields um, would be empty of text. So we used, um, to kind of get around this, we used Web Recorder's snapshot option to make captures of the intermediate view state and um, by that means, kind of express the generator's mechanism. We also wanted to give a sense of how this meme permeated the broader um, visual field and became 
um, increasingly recognisable and compelling in um, on the web. And, and we decided to use um, Google Images, which is really, I think, this era's sort of ubiquitous image aggregation tool um, to help us gather the dispersed posters together. We captured both the process of performing the search and the pool of the results we retrieved, um, calling the images forth by um, entering terms and phrases relating to the project and trying several different combinations and search strategies um, to, to kind of correlate a large, a large range of, of posters. Um, but to, re to actually produce a web archive which reveals the process of searching as well as the results, um, we, needed to s um, we needed to begin, um, sort of identify our seed or starting URL um, as images google.com um, and, and we, we sort of which is an uninteresting site in itself but um, when we were talking about it we realized it's like this this sense of um, over recording or archiving from the point which precedes the point you're interesting in actually helps us to um, capture the, the process of, of searching and finding. So all the actions involved and the pathway negotiated to reach the point are documented as part of the WARC or the Web Archive File Package. However, we encountered a really similar difficulty capturing the live search terms as we had done when we were attempting to record the mechanism of the poster generator. So when we're recording the search, the curator sees that they're typing terms and phrases into the engine as they would usually. Um, they see the, the words on their screen. But when the work is accessed, the initial search box is blank as before. So the view state has changed on the client side, but the actual page state hasn't. So no exchange has occurred between browser and server. However, what we found was that the, n the following um, page in sequence, so the results page, does display the search terms that were used within the text box that heads the page. Um, exploring, and, and you can see that here, so um, exploring our archived capture, we discovered that the Google image search provided more than just a flat plane um, of um, retrieved results. So I'll explain a bit more about this later, but within the limits defined by the curator's actions during the capture session, the archived search results page also, it does actually give an end user um, the opportunity to kind of ex excavate the results. So um, hovering over individual images activates um, the kind of uh, it's a um, should have put this on a side. It's a, uh, a narrow panel um, along the lower edge, which gives the dimensions and the initial part of the URL. And also, it's possible for somebody who's accessing the archived page to click on the individual images um, within the results. Um, and just as it does on the live web, it opens up this. Um, preview of the image within the contextual kind of focal panel and the panel provides some brief metadata including the um, the source site um, its header plus a snippet of text usually and it exposes the um, the image dimensions underneath um, underneath the enlarged preview um, and we also see that it it, col it collates these um, this set of related images. They um, they're they're low resolution um, thumbnails, um, and it's important to say that the uh, the hyperlinks that they um, they represent wouldn't be visitable unless a curator has actively clicked and decided to visit those sites during the archiving process. And I will, I'll explain more about actually using the tool and, and, and doing that work um, later on. But um, for now, I'm gonna um, just move on and show you 
another example. So um, this um, Tory bingo um, represents another graphic event. Rather than being collated on a single website, we find these posters distributed on Twitter um, where the pace of exchange is accelerated, public engagement is extended and dissemination takes a much more complex kind of dialogic um, form. The gestures of revision are really minimal and very quick. Um, it's about... Um, I think it's I think it's purely about a sort of visual articulacy and the swift wit of combining text with image. The um the origin is this um infographic which was released ahead of the coalition government's um spring budget of two thousand and fourteen. It was tweeted by the then Conservative Party chairman Grant Shapps. Offline it um the poster um, attracted national headlines and ignited um, a fairly fierce political backlash. Um, but online, it really stimulated a social media revolt. Um, I think the poster, um, any kind of poster published on the internet, we realise has a, a really different kind of vulnerability to defacement than traditional printed graphics not only because in the digital form the components can be easily dismantled, but also because these um, social cultures actually facilitate and fuel collective activism. And in this example, we, um, yeah, we see what, what ensued was this deluge of sardonic remakes which used alternative wordings to um, rebuke and ridicule the original. In terms of design, no, no single example is particularly interesting or interesting at all. But in aggregate, um, these visual parodies provide, they sort of vividly reveal how social media has augmented the way that publics can express their political distaste and how spaces like Twitter are changing the nature of graphic communication as a whole. Um, yeah, so rather than being collated on a website, the remakes are distributed across the platform. So therefore, to collect this graphic event, we're needing, first of all, to investigate the site of its distribution and then to find ways of aggregating a sample of its variants ourselves. Um, we observed how the posters were embedded within uh, extended comments threads and, um, and we, we saw that... It's, um, yeah, it's characteristic of the environment um, and it's very interesting because it provides poster curators with an unusual scope for insight. We can actually retrace the steps of an image's exchange and we can listen in on the dialogue that surrounds it. Unpacking the tweets in their native context, um, there's a renewed potential for curatorial analysis of the public's encounter with the poster. Um, metadata imprinted upon each tweet tells us exactly when the image was published um, and we're provided with a gauge of how many people saw it because we can see these tallies of comments, the replies, the retweets. Um, I think this data could also be helpful to us in terms of charting the pace and the duration of a meme's liveness to to discover whether its virality um, developed gradually or rapidly and whether that was sustained or brief. Um, sorry. Um, in her 2016 report, Preserving Social Media, Sarah um, very perceptively writes about the interlinked and conversational structure of social media and she observes that it's this which makes it really difficult for traditional web crawling technology to define the object to preserve. The Tory bingo case study I think specifically explores that problem. Collecting it involved actively visiting the platform to first identify an entry point from where we could hone in and then 
proceeding to form a sequence of thoughtful, intentional and focused searches in order to aggregate related tweets and materials. In this instance, we were able to identify a specific trigger tweet, and that's the, the original one posted by Shaps on 19th of March 2014. And it was from here that we set about aggregating the related materials. Um, direct replies could be found um, threaded in a conversation extended from this source tweet. But many of the subsequent shares, which really propelled this graphic forward, um, were retweets rather than replies, and scores of them didn't actually directly either reply to or mention um, Shaps's account handle. So it's therefore necessary to, um, to keep adapting our search terms and run a sequence of variant searches in order to retrieve um, the most comprehensive range of remakes as, as we can. So we, we started off using Shaps's own account handle as our anchor. And then we, 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 we began using Twitter's advanced search functions. Within, within advanced search, we can, um, we can search for tweets originating from, replying to, or mentioning um, a particular person or account handle. Meanwhile, um, we experimented with specifying um, various date ranges beginning from the 19th of March. Um, and, when, and when the search results had been aggregated, um, we found it was possible also to apply um, additional filters and we opted to filter the results um, by post type um, and, and selected to, to view only, f only posts which include photos and that, I mean, in the broadest possible sense, sort of images. So we use that tab, photos, on the top you see there. Um, very quickly after the meme took hold, the hashtag Tory Bingo um, began to be used. But hashtags are very frequently, as you know, established and then ignored or introduced and then changed. Um, so to draw together as much of the relevant content as possible, we tried several, including Budget 2014, which appeared on the original, Beer and Bingo, and Tory Bingo, which was by far the most widely adopted and persistently applied of those three. Again, we tested date ranges and um, tried narrowing our results with filters by post type, for example, that um, photos tab, um, and combined and varied search strategies um, with an understanding that really it wouldn't have been possible to retrieve all the relevant results using any, any single set of criteria. Um, what's helpful to both us as curators and to an end user is that um, advanced search terms are actually displayed in, in a bold banner above the results, you can see that here. Um, so, in a, so the aggregation never it never purports to be anything other than a sample retrieved within specific limits. Um, I just want to mention a few points of caution. Um, when we um, collect rep retrospectively, as we were doing in both of these cases. Um, an, in an inherent temporal incoherence occurs, so the embedded tallies of mentions, retweets and favourites reflect all the activity from the time of posting up until the time of collecting. So these metadata aspects are not responsive to the advanced search within a date range, for example. Another important note is that visually and technically Twitter's interface has changed significantly since 2014. So while the tweets are still retrievable, provided they haven't been deleted by the account holder, they are only retrievable within the current contextual surroundings, that is alongside current trending topics and within Twitter's current interface. 
I think um, maybe a, a kind of take home point is that curatorial orientation within Web 2.0 depends upon this kind of agility to perform in platform searches. Um, so I think it's critical that, that we begin to develop those skills. And also, um, there's an importance in knowing which hashtags are in, which w are in use, which accounts are active. I think such insights as those will be key um, to curators who want to trace the circulation of poster images. Um, it's really um, important that we remain attentive to the visual dialogue um, in order that we can target graphic events for capture and recognise the moments to collect them. Thank you, Anissa. Uh, so I just think it's such a good example of um, the complications of trying to even identify what you need to collect to represent um, the object, the work of art, or the community, or a certain um, yeah, sort of group or place. Um, so that was really thoughtful, very thoroughly sort of um, discussed and reflected on. So it was really good, thank you. So just before we break for lunch, I see the caterers are just now um, placing out sandwiches and whatnot. Um, maybe take a few minutes. Were there any questions um, that have occurred to people through the talks or thoughts? Yeah, Els? Hi, so I'm Els Breedstraat. I work for the European Union and we make a, or we try to make an EU web archive. And I have a question for the British Library. Um, I find it fantastic your initiative to nominate websites, but the response could be massive. Did you think of how to handle archiving all these things, how to store them, what the impact on resources, on, on workload, etc., will be? Um, is this is this work so in, in terms of the um, in terms of the, the the nominations we haven't so far been absolutely inundated with nominations I don't think Kalina and I think that scenario is one that we would quite welcome so we would quite welcome um, having to um, to deal with a vast number of nominations um, we're dealing with how many nominations on a daily basis It can vary, but one of our viral moments was when the BBC recipes went down. I think we got nine emails. <laughs> 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 so it's, uh, I'm, it, and there was another platform, some archaeology kind of like forum thing was shutting down, and maybe we got about four or five emails, and it was one that I'd never heard of before. But So it depends on the network and how clued in they are to the web archive, because usually when we go to talks like uh, with people that aren't information professionals, we do a, like a straw poll, how many people have heard of the UK web archive. I've been in some rooms where no one's put their hand up. So we, um, I, th I think, if if we're doing a, a really good job and getting the message of the UK web archive out there, and then we do re receive um, sort of bulk nominations, I think we would then have to um, automate the um, automate feeding those nominations into directly into our web archiving tool. And at that point, um, we have the the non print legal deposit checks. So this is the check that verifies if it's a UK website or not. As Helena mentioned in, in her talk, we don't do any um, moderation at all of, um, of website nominations, um, apart from if they're UK or not. Um, so we're not looking at them to, to, to look at the quality of the website or the message of the, of the website, so where it's kind of neutral and unmoderated. Sorry. Maybe had it's it's very interesting to hear about your automated approach that would be possible. This is highly relevant for us as well, so thank you. Um, but maybe I should have worded my question differently. Mm -hmm. Did you ask yourself the question before putting up the system of nominations? What if? What could the implications on budget, etc., be? 
No, I don't think we really have. Um, <laughs> I don't think we we have anticipated um, at all um, being inundated with um, with nominations. Um, I, we've we've just launched our new website, um, and so we did have a bit of a publicity drive around that. And I think probably we'll. Um, if eventually there's more of a public awareness of, of web archiving, I, I think that's when we'll we'll start to, to, to see nominations increase. Any last burning questions before we feed you? One here. Um, I was just wondering about um, the discoverability of um, things captured um, on the archive, um, in the UK web archive. Um, uh, if, uh, for example, if a community uh, archive, if, if that was their one preservation solution, and then their website went down, how, I don't know if this is something um, you've thought about before, but how would you expose that website again in a way that it was originally um, searched for? It seems to me that if someone knows about the UK Web Archive, then you can go to it and you can search for that original website. But if you don't, then that website is you know, largely hidden until you know to go and look for it there. So will you, do you have any thoughts about that, about what, how you might um, address that? Or Thanks. So we have, um, we have a front end which we perhaps could uh, we perhaps could show you uh, later on so our um, the entirety of our web arc is, is full text indexed so if the user um, knew the website that they were they're were looking for they could search for it directly by the URL if they if they knew it they could use keyword search terms and this um, then on our website searches across the the whole of the the data set what we don't do and what we can't do is provide a google like search experience so when you search on our um, website there isn't the same sort of ranking that google is able to to do um, and, and in fact the full text indexing causes a little bit of a problem in that there are many millions of search um, results returned. Um, we also make the, um, the, the the metadata for the archived websites. We expose that on the legal deposit libraries public catalog. So on the main British Library catalog, you can um, you can um, search for for websites there as as well. We're also plugged into the Mementos protocol, which um, federates openly accessible web archives, so Internet Archive, um, Parliamentary Archives, um, TNA, etc. So that is a um, that's another um, um, way to to retrieve that. We um, don't make archived websites, we don't expose them to the Google search engine. This, uh, we might reassess this, but there was a re request from some website publishers, particularly academics that are publishing research, that the if the um, archived website outranks their live websites in, their, in the search results, this is potentially um, damaging in terms of, of, of funding but it, it, it is um, it is an option um, for us to ex expose archived pages on on Google in the future um, has that answered the question a little bit okay okay well thank you again to our speakers this morning and um, we'll now break for lunch uh, and then collect everybody back about two or three minutes before when for our sort of practical workshop session thank you